Shabbat Shalom, guys. So I want to continue in the vein of Allison's drash. That was amazing. Even English, you know, language was used to exegete. It was quite clever. Um, so, you know, the Torah devotes this so much space to Bilam, to Balaam. You know, he is a wicked man. We know that. Everybody knows that. He's mentioned many times in the Bible as, as like one of the examples of, of wickedness being the, the false prophet. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of ahead of, getting ahead of myself. But, um, I mean, he's, he's a wicked guy. And he gets like three chapters in, in the Torah. It's a lot. It's like almost like Isaac. No, nobody else, you know, gets that. This is, this is like a very extensive, you know, treatment. So stands to reason that's important. That so much space is devoted to him. And then, you know, if he's wicked, then how is he able to, I mean, I understand how he's able to curse, but how is he able to bless? Okay, fine, you know, he, I mean, he uses demons to curse, I suppose. But then again, I don't know. I mean, can he, what, what's his blessing like? Is it real? I mean, apparently it is because we use these blessings even in the service. We start the service with Balaam's blessing. Matovu halecha Yaakov. We, we sing Matovu. That's Balaam's blessing. Yeah. So there are real blessings from the wicked guy. How's that? You know, how do we know he's, he's bad? Of course, we know he's bad because the Bible says he's bad. The, the, fruit of his, the fruit of his activities, by the fruit you will know him. This is the test of the false prophet. It's not whether the false prophet telling the truth or lie. It's by the fruit of the false prophet in, in life. So we know the fruit of what he did. And it was, it was uh, you know, a lot of damage that he caused. And we know that he's a false for that matter, he tried to lead people astray. He put the love of money and love of glory ahead of the love of God. Uh, in Proverbs 26, verses 1 through 3, it says, Like snow in the summer or as rain in, the, in, in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Like a flooding sparrow, like a darting swallow, so the undeserved curse does not come to rest. A whip is for the horse, a bridle is for the donkey, and a rod is for the back of the fools. As a dog that returns to his vomit, so is fool who repeats his folly. That's later on, verse 11, skipping. Uh, talks about this fool, but then, you know, in, in verse 2, it says, like a fluttering sp sparrow is like ketzipor. says, and, and tzipor is, comes up, this, this Torah portion, because... Uh, Balak, the king of Midian, of Moab, who hired Bilam, he is Balak ben Sipor. He is Balak, son of a bird. And um, and all the other war, all the other allusions in this passage of the Proverbs, is kind of point to Balaam's situation. You have undeserved curse that will not come true. You have the honor that, that Balak wanted to honor Bilam with, 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 with honor <laughs> and money. And uh, he said, no, the honor escaped you because you, you were not able to do what I asked you. So you wanted to honor. I'm not going to honor you now. And then the, 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 the whip for the horse, a bridle for a donkey. He rides a donkey and so on and so forth. So these are all Balaam's language in Proverbs that's used. So Proverbs clearly, the author of Proverbs clearly points to Balaam's situation. And he calls him a fool. He calls him a fool because he exchanged the gift of prophecy for seeking of gain, of some kind of material gain in, the, in, in, in this present moment. It makes him a fool. And that desire of the gain, if not, if not eliminated, makes the person repeat his folly over and over again, like the dog who returns to the vomit. Interesting that uh, second Peter, Peter and Second Peter, he, he brings down that same same principle, same verses. They, he talks about false prophets in uh, Ch Peter chapter two, calls them all kinds of bad names, um, and then he says in verse fifteen, it says, "They false prophets abandoned the straight way. They have gone astray, 
They followed the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved wages of wickedness. But he received rebuke for his own doing. A dumb donkey spoke with man's voice and put a stop to prophet's madness. Then he goes on uh, again to chastise Balaam and people like him. And then at the end it says, in this chapter it says, what happened to them confirms the truth of the proverb. A dog returns to its vomit and a, scrub, and a scrubbed pig heads ba right back into the mud. So yeah, so Peter also, he sees the connection between the Proverbs passage and Balaam's uh, story narrative, and uh, therefore equates Balaam with false prophet and a fool. Just like you know, I mentioned last time, there are three archetypical people in the, in the Bible. There is, well, there's king, prophet, and, and um, priest. So is there false king, false prophet, false priest. False king being uh, Cain, false prophet being Balaam, false priest being Korah. And these are three people that Jude mentions also in his discourse. So Balaam is this quintessential false prophet who leads people astray, even though his prophecy is true. And how, but how can he, you know, what was he hoping for? How did he, I mean, God told him, God will tell him, I will bless him, you cannot curse. What was he hoping for? Why did he even go? Why did he, you know, what, what was the point? God already told you not to go, why'd you go? Of course, he wanted, to, he wanted the money, he wanted the glory, but what, what technically was he hoping for? How was he hoping to accomplish it technically? And the sages say that he was trying, like the, the word for curse, ara, has in its root or. Or means light, meaning some, bring something to light, like bring some negativity to light. Find a chink in the armor and strike there somehow. There is a midrash that Rashi brings down about Balaam. It says, Balaam knew the moment of wrath of God, just as it's written in the, in, in, in the Psalms. Kirega Bayapo, Chaim Bertsono says that his, his, his wrath is for a moment, but he wants to give the life. And also it's written in the, and, and also he, he, as it says also in the Psalm, that God is angry with wicked every day. So therefore, there is this moment apparently of God's anger that Balaam, you know, knew was able to identify, was able to strike at that particular moment by saying the word kalem. Kalem means destroy. All of this is Midrash. Uh, Midrash is textually based, but what was he trying to do in terms of bringing something to light is to reveal incongruities, reveal the, the, the inconsistencies in the calling of Israel and their current state. That's why if you read the, the, his blessings, they, re, they read like the blessings, but if you analyze them, you can see that he perhaps was trying to curse somehow, but God just made his word a blessing. Because what he does in the first, second, and third blessing, he, 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 he says four blessings, three solicited, one unsolicited. So the, 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 it's like, just like the four-letter name of God. There, there's four there. So he has four, four blessings. The first three, you can see references there to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The first one, it says, I look at the hills and the mountains, and that, that is allusion to Abraham. Abraham is like the mountain, just because it says in Isaiah, look at the rock from which you have, you have been hewn. Then the, the, uh, the second blessing that he says, he says, Truat Melech Bo, the blowing of the shofar of the king is in, in him, and the shofar, the Truat shofar is allusion to Isaac, who was saved with, with, and the ram with horns from which the shofar come was offered in his stead. And of course, the third one, the third blessing is, uh, is Matavu Halecha Yaakov. It's like how good they are the tents of Jacob. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are seen in all three blessings of Bilam, as if to say, look at these patriarchs and look at these people. I mean, they can't, stay, they can't, they don't compare, they don't deserve the blessings of the patriarchs. God says, whatever, I'm still blessing them, but that's what he's trying to do in, in effect. And that's why also he goes and he says, maybe I can see, or, or, or Balak says, maybe you can see the end, like Tseha, maybe you can see the, uh, the little like not all of them, but just, just the outskirt of the people. And who is in the outskirt usually? On the outskirt are those who are weak and weary, those that were attacked by Amalek. Earlier in Exodus, they're weak and the weary, those the stragglers. So you go, let's go and look at the stragglers. Maybe because stragglers are usually, these are the, the, the students who sit in the back row. You know, those are the, back, the, the bad students, not the teacher's pets who are in the front row, but the bad students who are in the back. Let's, let me see those guys. Let me curse them. You know, maybe. 
you know, they have all these, you know, unreturned homework. Um, <laughs> trying to exploit the weakness of the people and say, God, look, look who's peop who your people are. Your people are, you know, they're not different from anyone else. And then when he says the blessing, I couldn't find iniquity in Yaakov, one of the words he says, I could not find iniquity in Yaakov. Couldn't find, meaning tried to find. <laughs> tried to find, but couldn't. He was like a detective. And then what he was doing also, if you see the language of, of him saddling the donkey in the morning, riding on the donkey, this is also Abraham's language. Abraham also saddled the donkey. Sages pick up on that, saying, on oh, Abraham, he, he beat you to it. You know, you, you saddle your donkey, but Abraham saddled his donkey before you, so he beat you to it, so you, can, you, you have nothing you know, there anymore for you. But, and then when he, as he goes, Balaam goes, you see this angel with a sword that opposes him. You have the talking donkey in the garden, like a talking animal. This is all like Garden of Eden language. You have the angel with a sword that guards the way of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. You also have a talking snake in the garden. There's only two instances of a talking animal in the Torah. One is a snake, the other is a donkey. So you have this Garden of So he, it seems like he's trying to retrace some steps of Abraham, trying to find any way that he can find some place where he can come in and, and bring a curse. And of course, it leads him to the way of the snake to the way of the garden where all the curses come from. He's trying to identify the, the weak point, and he cannot. He wants so much the money and the power that he is willing to go to extraordinary lengths to get them, despite the, you know, any, any, you know, any adversity that may meet, despite the angel with the sword. It doesn't matter for him either. He wanted so much. Before I was a believer, you know, I was doing bad things. I used, you know, used drugs. And I remember one time I wanted those drugs so much, I did crazy stuff. I'm looking back at that one night when I was trying to procure, and it's like what I did was just, just amazingly idiotic. Like the hoops I would jump, the places I would go, like dangerous places, going to, like you would not in your right mind even know. Like I, I did stuff that were like, you look back and say, this is so stupid. But at that time, I wanted it so much, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Well, Balaam here, he goes against the angel of the sword. That's like, you know, whatever I did or whoever else did, just pales in comparison. But people, but what it tells you is people are willing to do amazingly stupid things only for pursuit of what their desires. He builds seven altars to God, not to Baal. He goes, the, the, uh, Balak takes him to this Baal worship place, but, but he hasn't built altars to Baal. He builds altars to the Lord. Seven altars. You know, trying to somehow, and it's, there, is a, there is a notion in, in, in the Torah that, that uh, the scripture, that dream follows interpretation. As an interpretation, so goes the dream. So the interpreter of the dream has some power, apparently, how the dream will play out. That's why, for example, when uh, it was prophesied in the, in, the sec in the first temple, the first temple will be destroyed in the time of, uh, of the last king, um, oh, Zedekiah, they sent messengers, or you know, in, in one of those last kings, they said messengers. It was Jeremiah was around, and Jeremiah was telling them, it's going to be destroyed, it's going to be destroyed, it's going to be destroyed. And they sent messengers to ask what's going to happen. But not, they didn't send them to Jeremiah. They sent them to Hulda. The king sent messengers to Hulda, the prophetess, because perhaps she'll give him a different prophecy. Perhaps being, you know, perhaps more soft and not as harsh, she'll be able to reinterpret the prophecy and make it less, less harsh, less, less ominous, less, you know, less difficult. That was, you know, the, perhaps that was their intention. But in this case, that didn't work because God had opened the mouth of Balaam and did not allow him to put his spin on the things. God opened the mouth of a donkey. Of course he's going to open the mouth of Balaam and speak through them. That didn't work. Perhaps he wanted to consult astrology, and you can see that he wanted to because the, 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 this blessing, the last blessing, Matovu Achalecha Yaakov, that's full of this astrological language. It says, how goodly a tents of Yaakov, your dwelling place is Israel, as valleys <coughs> that are spread forth, gardens to the riverside, aloes which Hashem planted, the cedar trees beside the waters. 
water shall flow from its buckets. His seeds shall be in mighty waters. His king shall be higher than Agag. His kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He is for, he is for him as the strength of a wild ox. He shall eat up the nations. His adversaries shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down as a lion, as a lioness who shall rouse him up. Everyone blesses, be blessed, everyone curses, you curse. So these words that appear there, bucket, ox, lion, arrows, they're all constellations. Bucket is Aquarius, ox is Taurus, lion is lion. <laughs> um, what is it? Arrows is Sagittarius. You know, all of these are, all of these are constellation language in there, just like Isaiah 40 verse, you know, whatever the worst, I forgot. But, but it talks there, it's like all the nations, they're like a, a, a drop in the bucket, like a speck on the, on, on the scale. So, and it talks about the stars, look at the stars, who okay, is all these. And bucket and scale, there are constellations as well. Dli and Mosnaim, those are constellations, the, the Libra and uh, Aquarius. So all of these, you, you, you can see he's trying to find any type of way. And by the way, it says he, he pours the water in the bucket. To pour, that's the word for constellation, nazal. Nazal means to pour. Mazal is constellation. That's why mazal tov, we say. Mazal tov means good constellation, literally speaking. <laughs> And nazal is mean to pour. It's like, it's like a pipe. Because why? Because it's not like constellation decide anything at all. They're there to say the times. We know from the Torah, it says that the stars and the moon and whatever, they're there to tell it. it's a clock. It to tell you the time. Tell you the time when something will happen. And so when God pours blessing or not, you know, that's not the constellation that causes it. They're like pipes when they tell you when things will happen. It's like rooster does not, call, does not cause sun to rise. He just tells you when, when it rises, right? So in this case, he's trying to, to even find in the constellations any type of, of, of a sign or a way. And instead, he says, all these constellations are working in favor of Israel. They're all, the, just like it says in, in the book of Judges, in the Song of Dvorah, it says, the stars fight against Sisera. The stars in the heaven were fighting against Sisera. Even that. So even, even that was on the, on the side. Because why? Because God has made his creation so, so that his people, Israel, will be successful. So those that are for God will be successful no matter what. If, of course, they stay with the program. If they don't go after the desires of their heart. If they don't put their own desires ahead of the God desires. And everything that would happen to them will happen for good no matter how it will feel in the interim. And then the greatest star of them all comes. It says in, in, in 23.17, it says, I see him, but note now. I see him, but not near. Darach kochav mi Yaakov shevet mi Israel. A star will come from Yaakov, a scepter rise from Israel, and shall strike through the corners of Moab and break down the sons of Shet. You know, klala, the curse, has in it also word kol. Kol means all. So as if to say, that's all there is. It's not going to get better. Curse it. It's, it, like, it has an end. It doesn't have any continuation. It is fruitless. Just like Yeshua, when he saw the fig tree, says, you have no fruit. He curses the fig tree. Why? Because there's no fruit. It's, that's all there is there. Cursed it because it's fruitless. So anything that's fruitless is cursed by definition. Everything that's fruitful is blessed. Therefore, the word for klala, meaning that's all there is, cursed. But what, what happens here, Mashiach, who has no beginning, it was like everything that has an end has a beginning. But something that has no beginning will not have an end. Mashiach does not have a beginning. Messiah, Mashiach, was with God from the very beginning. Before the beginning, he was with God all the time. Therefore, everyone who connected with him cannot be cursed by definition, cannot be separated from source of eternity, does not have an end. That's right, yeah, I agree. But he found a solution. Balaam did find a solution. Idolatry and immorality. It's like, uh, you know, he sent them women with idols. I mean, I'm sure he, they liked women more than they liked idols. But just like in the Soviet Union, they used to sell the, uh, the packages in the store. They used to sell, like, the, the, there was shortage of everything. Everything was a shortage. Maybe, maybe you know, I don't know. Thank God we don't know what that is. But uh, except for COVID toilet paper. <clears throat> <laughs> but the, uh, 
There was shortage of everything. And every time they bring some, some, some uh, like merchandise that was in demand, first of all, they limit how much you can buy. And second of all, they sell it. But in, in addition, they sell you something else as well that you don't want really. Nobody will ever buy it, like the book of the decisions of the 27th summit of the Communist Party. There was, there was, the last, there was a book of the decisions. <laughs> but they would sell it in addition to some merchandise that you need. So you have to buy both. So I guess that was the that was that was that situation there. Um, I don't know, I'm just speculating. But but the <laughs> you would know them by the fruit. That was the fruit of the false prophecy of Balaam. That was a full. That was the fruit of the false prophet. That the fruit was that he sent these people, these 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 women, to to bring forth sin and immorality. And of course, he as a result he dies by the sword. The sword he saw on the way when he went to curse the Jewish people, bless, curse, bless. He saw the angel with a sword. He dies by that sword later on when the revenge is finally exacted upon him. So false prophets are not necessarily those who give false prophecies. They can be correct or partially correct. But they, the result would be they, they will lead people astray. Is that a thing of the past? No, no, I mean, look at the 2020 election. There were so many prophets saying things that didn't come to pass. Well, okay, they didn't come to pass, fine. What about now? I mean, this guy pops up on the internet. I mean, it's, just, it's an elephant in the room, right? The, the assassination, Trump assassination attempt. And then this guy pops up on the internet, some prophet guy who posted a video in March, which is true, Saying Trump will be, a, there'll be, I don't know if you saw this video, so there'll be an assassination attempt on Trump's life, and it's right, and the ear thing, it's right, and he says he's going to drop to his knees, probably right too, because he was like laying down there, and then uh, he says that he's going to have legal problems and they will go away, and he's right, and then he says uh, not that everything's going to be fine, he's gonna, he says there'll be like economic crisis and the depression, he's probably right. By the way, you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy that, you don't have to prophesy, just... <laughs> You just look, just look at the fundamentals of the economy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just a matter of time. It's a time bomb. So you don't have to be a prophet for that. Um, and he's like, wow, you know, this guy is right. But then you look at all the other th stuff that he does, and he's like saying nonsense all the time. So by, by the, like all the other videos that he has. So it's like you don't have to trust, believe, and go by, by these people necessarily just because they were right one time or something like that. It doesn't, it doesn't mean they're wrong. They can't. But you don't have to like, you know, attach your life to, the, to that and, and guide it by this kind of stuff. You have to be guided by something that's more concrete, something that has a track record, something that can be verified, something that's, that, that has a strong foundation. This is what we are to be guided for. You know, be very careful not to be deceived because good fruit does not come from a bad tree. In Revelations 2.14, it says this. I have few things about the um, Pergamum, uh, the admonition against the community of Pergamum. I have a few things against you. You have some people who, there who follow teaching of Balaam, who instructed Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so they would eat the food sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality. In the same way, there are also some among you who follow teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come against you quickly and make war against those people with the sword of my mouth, just like he killed Balaam with the sword. The one who has an ear had better hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To the one who conquers, I'll give him some of the hidden manna and I'll give him the white stone. And on that stone will be written a new name that no one can understand except the one who receives it. It's interesting when it says uh, hidden manna in Greek is like crypto manna. That's what it says. <laughs> Well, crypto means hidden, like cryptology is the code. Like, it's cryptomana. And, and you can connect, in te te intertextually, you can actually connect mana with gold. It's, you know, it's a bit complex, but there is a connection from Numbers 11 when they were saying we're sick of mana, like our souls are dried up because of this mana, vayafshenu, nafsham, like that's word vayafshenu, dried up, is connected with the word pishon. Pishon is one of the rivers that come out of the Garden of Eden. It says there is gold in there, and there is, kori, uh, and there is like 
um, bdolach, I don't know what that is, some kind of crystal. And manna is also likened to bdolach, likened to crystal. So you can therefore like, logically say manna is like equal gold. If A equals B, B equals C, then C equals A. Then you can connect manna with gold. Because money, what do you need money for? Money you need to buy food. <laughs> it's the fundamental. You know, that's the first thing you buy with money is food. Then you buy everything else. Then you buy a Ferrari. First you buy the food, then you buy a Ferrari. <laughs> Not the other way around, because you cannot eat the Ferrari. So, so money starts, you know, it's a fundamental thing. So manna is, is connected with food. And, and by the way, the white stone that he's referring to, some kind of a, um, an ID pass, some kind of pass to enter some kind of high society. Um, it's, t it's, it's a sign of honor. So it's money and honor. It's basically money and honor. The old, true money and honor, honor come from God. And this is what Balaam was after. He was money, he was after honor. He went and, and you know, Balak prom promised him money and he promised him to honor him and he gave him nothing. In the end, I don't know what he, maybe he gave him something, but, <clears throat> but you can see that, that the true reward, there is true reward, there is true <laughs> money, which is hidden manna that one receives in the world to come, and there's true honor, which is the admission into, into, the, uh, the, into heaven, into community in heaven. And this real food, the real manna, you know, when Yeshua is taught, asked by his disciples, as John 4.31 says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. Sounds like my family in Passover. <laughs> when, I, when I'm trying to do the Seder, uh, that's the first thing he says. Eat something. Just eat. Just eat. Just don't say anything. Just shut up. Eat. We don't want to hear about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Rabbi, eat something. He said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples began to say one another, No one brought him anything to eat. Did they? Yeshua said to them, my food is to the will of the one who sent me to complete his work. Don't you say there are four more months and then comes harvest? I tell you, look up and see the fields are already white with harvest. Four more months there is harvest. And, and these passages of John, you know that he's, it's chapter 4 of John. This is a Samaritan woman story where he comes to, to the well and he asks her to give him to drink. She says, okay, and she said, but then, then she says, if you know who, would, who asks you, uh, he would, you would ask him, and he'll give you living water. And by the way, the living water is the, uh, is the term for Holy Spirit, because we know later on the, Holy, the living water coming out of someone, that's the, that's the analogy of the Holy Spirit. And he says, how can you give me water? You don't have a bucket. I mean, you don't even have, and then he tells you, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, um, salvation of the Jews and all that. And he, then he says to his disciples, four more months, there is harvest. Harvest is Shavuot. Shavuot is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Right? Four more months. So Shavuot comes in the month of Sivan. If you subtract four months, there'll be months of Shvat. Because Sivan, Iyar, Nisan, Adar, Shvat. Be months of Shvat. Months of Shvat is Aquarius. Aquarius is the bucket. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. But what is truly the case is that, and by the way, the, 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 show, the Sivan, the, the month of Shavuot, the, this, the sign is twins. Oh, Gemini. Two tablets. <laughs> Two tablets. <laughs> They're twins. But okay. Testimony of the Mashiach is the spirit of prophecy. The stars, they serve the Mashiach. They're at his beck and call. They don't say anything independent. If we attach ourselves to the Mashiach, the star of all stars, we have no concern about anything else. We have no concern about any prophecy, good or bad. We have no concern about whatever happens in the world, good or bad, whether there are tribulations, whether there is shakings, whether there is anything else, any type of calamity that is upon us, anything that everybody predicts and prophesies, it doesn't really matter. If you, we connect ourselves to the Mashiach, the one from whom all comes, then, then there is nothing to be afraid of. We will not be led astray. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved. The fields are white with harvest today. In connection with the Mashiach, we can accomplish the purpose that we, what we are sent for, 
and without any concern, without any worry of anything else that may come against us. Father in heaven, we pray that no matter what's going on in this world, no matter what shaking are about to transpire, when the wind blows and the flood comes and the water rises, if we build our house on the rock, if we listen to the words and obey the words of the Mashiach, we will be likened to those who build their house on the rock and all the winds and come and nothing would happen. This house would stand and not be moved. We pray, Father, that we will be able to set aside all our desires that lead us astray, that uh, cause us to abandon the way of the Lord, that cause us to take ways of fools. Lord, we, we pray for wisdom to know, to be able to discern the way of the wise and follow it, to reject all falsehood and follow the truth so the Holy Spirit will guide us in all truth so that we'll be true worshipers of God, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that your son, Mashiach Yeshua, will be shown in us mightily, will shine through us mightily to the brightness of the day, just as it is written, the way of the righteous like the light of the sun shining brighter and brighter until full day. We pray this, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen.